Hello, my name is Joe Mahan, and I'm going to be reading my book, Football Poems, a collection of 70. The first poem is called Lombardi's Faith. He had a lifelong belief in himself and the heavens above. Family, God, and football were his loves. He played in college on the famous Seven Blocks of Granite and later built a pro team, the finest on the planet. He was an assistant for the Giants in 1958. The title game went into overtime, New York against Baltimore, flickering black and white TV images creating sports lore. A high school teacher for years, many players, when remembering him, could be moved to tears. Perseverance and concentration were the keys to success, he thought, more so than education and talent, and this is what he taught. He was passed over for jobs again and again, but he held strong. His faith was present there all along. The next poem is called Bill Parcells and a Poem. He came across a poem as a young man and had it with him ever since. Written within it, wisdom, vision, words that, like him, didn't mince. He talked about how it changed his life, helping also his players avoid much strife. I remember when he came to lead my team, the region buzzed with excitement, knowing that he would assure sturdiness in every seam. A football coach doesn't seem one given to poems, but you would be surprised how many of them read into the night while far away or at home. The next poem is called 199 Tom Brady. 199 is not a number like three for Ruth or four for Orr that comes to mind in sports lore. But 199 to one man inspired vision and purpose, a groundwork, a plan. Passed by and by into the sixth round only fueled the fire. A blacksmith forging the iron, a hammer coming down. Overlooked, not taken serious, they thought he couldn't get it done. How many of us can relate? Let's buckle up, show them, and make a run. Tom Brady made his way to the top, a Hollywood gridiron, the fame. Just don't forget, he was selected at 199. No red carpet welcomed him. On that day, it rained. The next poem is called Broadway Joe Namath. What did he represent in the counterculture? Certainly not the past. This couldn't be the future. Joe Namath brought forth change, and not only in football. His influence had a broader range. But what did he do that helped turn the tide? He didn't fit into a mold. He wasn't along for the ride. Oh, there were many others breaking from the past. The malt shop days weren't going to last. But on the field, he was part of a team, a spoke on the wheel, a stitch in the seam. He was the first to pass for over 4,000 yards, freewheeling. But in Super Bowl III, he managed the game, not throwing a pass in the fourth quarter, safe dealing. Broadway Joe moves between two worlds, one in a rush. I don't know if it matters, but I wonder, was he the canvas or the brush? The next poem is called Tailgate. They arrive early to get ready, after working all week honest and steady, preparing to feast on burgers and steaks before the game at stadiums many near rivers and lakes. They love their team no matter the record and tell stories of games past, seasons, and memories that will last. My brother and I talked of our team winning that Super Bowl. What a playoff run when they got on that roll. 
and we are all general managers in the parking lot, sometimes better choices are made out here than the person taking the number one parking spot. From city to city, region to region, the tailgaters unite in peace every season. The next poem is called All Time Backs. Jim Brown is Mount Everest, considered to be standing above them all. But cowboy fans might say Emmett, with the records and rings, stands just as tall. Sweetness delivered blows like he was on defense and Barry Sanders dazzled foes with moves and talent, no pretense. John Riggins powered his way to seal a Super Bowl win, and Earl Campbell from his opening season, a star, let's begin. Gail Sears was a comet. Tony Dorsett was smooth. Terrell Davis sadly didn't play long, a champion in a groove. Eric Dickerson ran upright a former track star, and standing in Canton, this sprinter went far. Curtis Martin wasn't flashy but steady like the rain, a Parcells guy who grinded his way to the Hall of Fame. Many other backs thrilled fans, live or watching at home. Great athletes performing in vast stadiums, some say a modern-day Rome. <clears throat> The next poem is called Concrete. He fought in a war unlike any before, and when he returned to the game, he became part of football lore. After being in battle, compared, he didn't think anymore football was much of a chore. The last 60-minute man playing center and middle linebacker, he led Philly to a title against Lombardi and the Packers. It was Vince Lombardi's only playoff defeat, the game-ending tackle made by the man called Concrete. Chuck Bignarek was called Concrete Charlie, befitting his style of play and also the product he sold. Two jobs was the rule of the day. When he tackled Frank Gifford, they say it sounded like a crack, and the Giants player was out cold, lying on his back. He would count his rosary during the days. His faith led him to strive in many ways. <clears throat> the next poem is called The Bricklayer's Son. He worked for his father as a kid, catching bricks to be put in place. A task was something for which he never hid. He took this work ethic with him to the pros and worked and worked through the highs and lows. Was he born with talent? Who can say? Or did repetition and sweat pave the way? He had grace and poise running on the football field, but his hands were his treasure, producing a golden yield. He took the record books to a new height and began training right after the season, running the hills, chasing the light. He was voted the best who ever played. Through hard work, obstacles were slayed. Jerry Rice, the bricklayer's son, stared down a challenge he didn't run. The next poem is called First a Fan. He was just another fan back then, sitting in the stands. Was he dreaming of owning the team one day and what would be his plans? To restore the glory days? No, they had not won. To bring home a championship, the work had begun. Oh, they had given the fans great memories during the past, but a Super Bowl win is forever, something that will last. He assembled a staff and a team that would win it all, beating the greatest show on turf, then becoming a dynasty. For Patriots fans, was this heaven on earth? From one fan to another, thanks, Robert Kraft, for building such a team. Many list them side by side with the best ever seen. The next poem is called He May Never. The quickest release ever, likely so. The greatest 
Greatest at his position? Oh, I don't know. A competitive fire for sure. His legend, no doubt, will endure. Throwing spirals in the Miami sun or fastballs in the cold, his team mostly won. He had a chance to win it all, but ran into another great quarterback who, in the biggest of games, simply didn't fall. He was an artist with his arm and shuffling feet, eluding tacklers in the pocket they were rarely to meet. He may never have been on a team that finished the deal, but Dan Marino always showed his heart was real. The next poem is called The Power Sweep. They ran the play over and over, in games, in practice, on the bus. Here's what we do, stop us. No tricks, no gimmicks, no schemes. Stopping this play is no field of dreams. Mr. Cowboy called it the simplest offense he'd ever seen, and he played against it once when it was minus 17. Lombardi built his team on this play. It will work. Perseverance was his way. Over and over, we'll run the power sweep. Five championships later, this team earned many a good night's sleep. The next poem is called Air San Diego. He was the Don of the Air, Coach Coriel, and Sid, Gil Sid Gilman drew up innovative pass plays the opponents could sure tell. They both worked through the skies, Footballs in flight, laces spinning in the California sun over defenders' hands, goodbye. The powder blue with Lance Allworth running routes, and a generation later, there was a quarterback, Dan Fouts. Don Coriel coached the air attack near the San Diego surf, and Dick Vermeil used this philosophy that fueled the greatest show on turf. Maybe in heaven they play a game, Vince Lombardi's team and Sid's. Football's polar opposites, power and grace, winners just the same. The next poem is called The Kansas Comet. The Kansas Comet burst onto the scene. Sadly, he didn't play long, but he left lasting memories that were a dream. As a rookie, he did things on the field that filled many a highlight reel. A movie was made about him and a teammate friend. Brian's song touched millions, a bond to the end. He was the youngest ever elected to the hall, well-deserved, considering how he ran with the ball. So maybe he was nick nicknamed the Kansas Comet for a reason. Gale Sears' light shines so bright in five short seasons. The next poem is called The Bay Area. The red and gold glistening in the sun, Walsh, Montana, and Rice, mind and body working as one. The silver and black played their own style, going deep for decades, not just for a while. Ronnie Lott simply got things done, and Gene Upshaw and Art Shell cleared the way for the run. Jim Plunkett had bounced around until winning two Super Bowls. Cheers were finally the dominant sound. They drew up a play in the dirt, and America's team sadly felt the hurt. Mirroring Athens and Sparta, the Bay Area produced teams, two ways to succeed, a gridiron of dreams. The next poem is called Quarterbacks Taken Number One. They are first in their class, taken number one. Many don't quite live up, some walk away having won. Terry Bradshaw was the first choice, winning four Super Bowls and later a talented broadcast voice. Troy Aikman had a 1-15 rookie year, but three Super Bowls later, he stood in the pocket, steady, no fear. They said Peyton Manning couldn't win the big game, but there he stood holding the trophy in the Miami rain. John Elway endured three tough losses, but retired winning back-to-back -back in an MVP for his tosses. Jim Plunkett took a beating out of the gate. Was there a reason? 
finishing with a 8-2 and two playoff record and two championships, a class act in every season. Broadway Joe Namath, the brash number one, winning the historic game. No one could say Broadway Joe couldn't get it done. The next poem is called The Greatest Show on Turf. It's easy to love a story about a man stocking shelves on a night crew and a few years later holding up a Super Bowl trophy wearing the Rams yellow and blue. How can you not enjoy watching Marshall Falk do it all, catching passes like a receiver and making cuts that make the best defenders fall? Imagine a coach leaving the game, exhausted from work. Things weren't the same. And 14 years later, he returned. The fire never went out. The flame still burned. The coach came back but had to change his ways. His first two years were tough, but in year three, the waters calm, not as rough. And as Dick Vermeil and Kurt Warner hugged, on a Super Bowl podium in a dream come true sh trance, the man previously stocking shelves thanked his coach for the chance. The next poem is called All Alone. They might be the best athletes in the world, considering their job description, fulfilling many varied tasks. You make the decision. First, they have to fight off the block of a John Hanna clearing an alley for the run, then tackle an Earl Campbell power back. They've had plays that were more fun. On the next play, they cover a former sprint champ with hands as sure as a Willie Mays glove. Staying with the receiver stride for stride, for some reason, this is the position they love. So they can't be too big to keep up with Mark Clayton and they better be tough to fight off a block and tackle Walter Payton. So the corners are an island all alone. Part of a team, but many times far from home. The next poem is called The Buffalo Bills. This team was an example for all to see about getting up and trying again, but they were not going to flee. Beaten once, they came back. Twice, they returned. Will was something they had learned. The third time wasn't the charm. It hurt, but they didn't hide in the barn. Back for a fourth time, another low. This would be the end of the line. Four Super Bowl losses in a row. Our country loves a winner, a pat on the back. But the ones who get up time after time, character is the one thing they don't lack. So for this fan, and I think many more, the Buffalo Bills say a lot about our country. The effort, the heart, no frills. The next poem is called Monday Night. Frank Gifford played college ball in sunny L.A. He then grinded out a Hall of Fame career in New York on many a cold day. Dandy Don Meredith did his best in trying to beat the Packers and Vince then became a groundbreaking broadcaster, a lovable American prince. Howard Cosell told it like it was. Never before had a sportscaster created such a buzz. Pete Rozelle and Rune Arledge invented a new brand on the day following the weekend dreamland. They added cameras and production to enhance the show. The fans loved it, and Gray Monday suddenly had a glow. The first Monday night game had Broadway Joe. An instant hit, did they know? The next poem is called NFL Films. They began with coaches wanting them thrown off the field, but like Vince Lombardi taught, perseverance can produce a wonderful yield. Viewing their work as art, their cameras, music, and the voice of John Facenda set this game apart. Their founder, Big Ed Sable, set the bar high, reaching like Cecil B. and Hitchcock for the sky. Capturing the sport like none had seen, the Kansas Comet Gale Sears or David Deacon Jones came glowing through the screen. Showing images of games past allowed, 
allowed fans to learn the history, memories that will last. Many grew up with NFL films, The Game Does Inspire, You Are Part of America, A Flicker Turned Into Fire. The next poem is called Prime Time. He is light, he is speed, but you know full lush, you're a lunch pail guy getting the job done when there's a need. Using cunning to trick the quarterback, an interception producing six, not three, and running it back to pay dirt, holding up the ball for all to see. Blessed with speed and grace, his teammate and friend, the playmaker, talked about Prime's work ethic that made him one of the greats. So Deion Sanders is lights and cameras. Prime time is a star, but his hard work and dedication allowed him to go so far. The next poem is called Dynasty Bound, Five Decades. In the 60s, it was the Packers. Vince Lombardi won Super Bowls one and two. They also won five NFL titles, three in a row. Their accomplishments were many, not few. The 70s brought the Steelers, a foundation started by drafting Mean Joe Green. All these years later, it's still the best defense ever seen. The 80s and the 49ers were new age, smooth, not tense. And Bill Walsh implemented the West Coast offense. The 90s saw Jimmy Johnson come from college to the pros. And he built a champion in Dallas featuring Emmett Smith, the playmaker Michael Irvin, and Troy Aikman's throws. The new century began with a quarterback taken in the sixth round, but Tom Brady believed in himself, and the Patriots were dynasty-bound. The next poem is called The Ice Bowl. Two brothers and a friend were playing in the snow one winter. The older brother said to the friend, going home to watch the big game. The younger brother followed behind, not knowing what game he was talking about. The younger brother watched a contest that would make him a lifelong fan. He watched in awe as the players fought for footing, hands freezing in the frigid Green Bay cold, as an epic game would unfold. He first heard the name on this day, Vince Lombardi, and all the years since respected the coach and his way. He built his team to play They won on a last second's goal line touchdown, the famous block, the legendary drive. Fans breathing out the freezing air, the field a frozen ice patch. On the line, a chance to advance to the Super Bowl. The first game watch, still clear, remained with him always, that snowy day in memory, always near. The next poem is called Even Steven. The upstart AFL, American Football League, stood in the long shadow of the NFL, the old guard looking down at them as they played in stadiums and fields, moving about like a summer carnival. But the AFL surprised and grew with a brand of football the fans like something new. Broadway Joe, Lance Bambi Allworth, Exciting, exciting stars joined the fold, scratching and clawing for their peace. The new league had some gold. The NFL stood strong in the 1960s with Lombardi leading the brand, but the AFL kept coming until a championship game, AFL versus NFL. The Super, the first Super Bowl was at hand. The NFL won the first two Super Bowls. The Packers unstoppable, a forceful flow. But things changed in Super Bowl III. The AFL won, led by Broadway Joe. Super Bowl IV would be the final act. The leagues would merge next season. In fitting, it would place the owner who started the AFL, Lamar Hunt, and his Chiefs to stamp the league's final fact. The American Football League, the AFL, the upstart. Two and two, even Steven.
The next poem is called Four Coaches. In college, they said he couldn't win the big game. And for a while in the pros, they said the same. But he was a worker, a grinder. He studied day and night. A number one overall pick, expectations were always high. And he kept improving, growing. His limit, the sky. His team got close and fell short. But then in an AFC title game, down 21-3, things changed. They go on to win a Super Bowl. No longer is he viewed as a loser. Three more times he will lead his team to the championship game. He conducted an explosive attack, amassing a 2-2 Super Bowl record as a quarterback. 1-1 with the Colts, 1-1 with the Broncos. Very impressive, and consider the fact Peyton Manning went to four Super Bowls with four different coaches. Lombardi won five titles with Starr. Noel, four with Bradshaw. Belichick, six with Brady. Peyton Manning did what he had to do. Fight, scratch, throw a beautiful ball his way. And a gold jacket in the hall. The next poem is called The Snow Game. This game was played on a Saturday night under the lights, the last to be played in this stadium, the new one being built next door. A playoff game, the stakes high, two rivals from the old AFL, fighting to go to the AFC title game. Perhaps a playoff run, a chance to soar. Jerry Rice is catching balls off his shoe tops in the snow. The Raiders take a 13-3 lead on the road. This franchise has succeeded before. Three titles. Tonight, they're in the flow. But the Patriots fight on. During this New England night, Tom Brady's first playoff game, no giving up, make it right. They stop the Raiders on fourth down, can't make a yard to ice the game. And John Gruden points to this play as the one that could have carried the day. Brady scores a touchdown and spikes the ball his enthusiasm overflowing as the snow continues to fall. The Patriots win in overtime, and Adam kicks his way into legend. To Patriots fan, this game stands tall. The next poem is called One Yard to Glory. Don't let a chance slip away, especially when it's within your grasp. Be smart, seize the day. They had a chance to be rated on defense in the same sentence as the 1985 Bears. Not to be a bad play makes no sense. A year before, they dominated, winning a Super Bowl and beating Peyton Manning 43-8. Their defense crushed the Broncos. Now a year later, trying to beat Tom Brady, they're scrambled, confused. Their offense, for some reason, in a rush. Run it. Better odds to win a royal flush. The Legion of Boom defense watched from the sidelines. Couldn't believe what they saw. Back to back, one yard away, second down, plenty of time, and a timeout. What happened? How? Perhaps they outsmarted themselves. He's an undrafted rookie. No match for us. We'll throw. They didn't know what he had inside. Ice water for blood. A champion's drive. Malcolm Butler made a play, an historic game-ending interception. He's Super Bowl royalty now. He took hold. It's my day. The next poem is called Joe Gibbs. He began his NFL coaching career going 0-5, not a good start. But fighting on, he would one day enter the Hall of Fame. Guided by a worthy sea captain's chart, Bill Parcells credited him with starting the one-back offense with two tight ends, a way to slow down Lawrence Taylor, the best defensive player ever. An offensive wrinkle added to the blend, he built the Hogs, one of the all-time blocking lines. Defenses hit and smashed in a fog. But one thing he did that had not been done before winning three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks, all said quite a chore. 
Lombardi won five titles with Starr, Noel four with Bradshaw, Walsh three with Montana, Belichick six with Brady. A pattern is revealed. Hall of Fame coach and quarterback Joe Gibbs held three trophies with good quarterbacks near. His method charted out, a captain viewing a star, vision clear. The next poem is called A Cowboy Run. In Dallas rose an interesting story. Their team won back-to-back titles and the coach quit, halted glory. Lombardi tried twice to win three in a row. Two and one in the first run, three and oh the next. Jimmy Johnson had a chance to accomplish something unique, stand with Lombardi with a three and oh. But water shift and the owner is now captaining the ship. Jerry Jones is in charge and needs a coach, a gem. He hires, like Jimmy Johnson, a winner from college, with swagger in common between them. Barry Switzer arrives to coach a back-to-back champion. He didn't cause this circus. His new goals? To win in the pros. Let's stir these hot coals. The owner prays to heaven above. Just one more title and I'll rejoice and sing. The first year, Dallas loses to the 49ers and Steve Young moves on to claim his ring. The next year, they win it all. That's three out of four, a dynasty. Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson, and Barry Switzer, an interesting tale. Winners all, competitors by trait, maybe not pretty, but refusing to fail. The next poem is called Smooth Transition. Sometimes things just flow from one to another. Sometimes effort is involved, a Beatles song moving into the choir, the music, the melody, free as snow. Other times a change is jagged and rough, moving on from Lombardi and Marino, extremely tough. Two times comes to mind when a plan was put in place, train the replacement, wait in line, study, learn, develop, then when ready, your time to shine. The legend still with gas in the tank, not ready to walk away. But senses the presence of replacement. It will come that dark day. Steve Young and Aaron Rodgers waited in the wings, watching Joe Montana and Brett Favre do their thing. Joe and Brett champions on their way to the hall. Now Steve and Aaron take over and do not fall becoming champions themselves and all-timers. A smooth transition considering for all. (laughs) The next poem is called The Game Before. He is famous for Super Bowl III, Broadway Joe Namath, his flamboyance, the guarantee, beating the mighty NFL a first with the entire nation to see his finger raised to signify we're number one. Etched into memory for a generation, a changing era, a rising sun. But the game before stood almost as tall, beating the Raiders in epic battle. Fight, run, block, don't stall. On a cold, windy day in New York, the Jets take on the Raiders, the defending AFL Kings. Punch for punch, like two heavyweights, they slug it out, just like in the ring. Broadway Joe dislocates a finger on his left hand. Just tape it, march on like the band. The wind causes a turnover, and Joe lowers his right shoulder to crush the interceptor out of bounds. I've got a long one reserved if you need, and Namath and Maynard connect. The Jets take the lead, and later the wind turns on the Raiders. Home field advantage indeed. The next poem is called Worthy Pick. Taken high in the draft, so much expected. Already compared to others before, no learning curve, no time to mold my craft. In baseball, Mickey Mano, the green young player, the pressure closed in. 
Does he measure up to Joe DiMaggio? Years needed to be at that level, a slayer. Drafted high, that's the deal. Produce or else. Business is cold, real. Some buckle under the weight, a truckload, too heavy, the freight. Others greet what's ahead. A confident mindset churning instead. Willie McGinnis taken fourth in the draft, being compared to Lawrence Taylor, both playing for Bill Parcells. Others' ex- expectations, kind of a shaft. But he worked, proved his salt. If he fails, no one to blame, his fault. Working, working, with weights, film, and on the field, a harvest came in, a wonderful yield. He anchored a defense that won three out of four, a dynasty, and broke the record for playoff sacks. Willie McGinnis was a worthy pick. Drafted high, living up to the bill, he worked and worked, climbed the hill. The next poem is called Passed Over. Not a positive feeling, others thinking you're not good enough, but it's what you think, that's the stuff. Tom Brady slid until pick 199, a chip on his shoulder developed. It fueled him, that's fine. Two coaches considered, quite possibly the best, passed over on teams where they worked. I'm not shrinking, this is a test. Vince Lombardi won a title with the Giants as their offensive coordinator, 47-7 in 1956. A couple of years later, they needed a coach and passed on the hometown New York boy. But Green Bay gave Lombardi a chance, and in year three, he beat the Giants 37 to nothing for the championship. A year later, another title, 16-7, to won against them. He went to work, a firm, solid stance. Bill Walsh didn't get the nod in Cincinnati, the Bengals thinking he had no tiger inside. Then he beat them twice in the Super Bowl, outdueling two coaches and quarterbacks. His 49ers champions, filled with pride. So there you have it. Pass them by if you will. Just consider the fire in their belly that you will instill. The next poem is called The Burner. He ran the 100 meters in college, 10.0 seconds, his personal best. Carl Lewis ran the same 10.0 time to win Olympic gold, pass the test. He played 14 seasons for the Raiders, winning three Super Bowls, TDs in all. Electrifying f- speed and sure hands, something in constant demand. Cliff Branch came into the league flying by people with his speed, like a race car in the lead. He ended as a sure-handed possession receiver, moved the chains, score. And he did so much more. The Raiders were the first to win two, then three Super Bowls as a former team from the old AFL. Now we're in the NFL, another chapter begins. Cliff Branch was inside and out. A Raider, silver and black on display, like Art Shaw and Gene Upshaw leading the way. Intensity drive all day. First images, speed to burn. Last impressions, adapt and learn. The next poem is called Determined. From Pakistan to Illinois, he arrived at 16 one December night. Wearing shoes not suited for snow, he walked after his long flight. Studying engineering, he got his degree, then went door to door seeking opportunity. He worked and studied at the manufacturing plant, twisting and shaping metal and growing the business, but he was not to stay. He went went on his own for a while and did well. No ill will. And later bought the company he had left. And grew it much larger still. Building a strong Made in America brand. Flexing gate and auto parts company in this land. And down the road he called around to NFL owners and league executives. Seeking to buy a team. And test new ground. Shad Khan bought the Jaguars in the Florida sun. An automobile man he has proven that he can make things run. (coughs) 
The next poem is called Ozzie Newsom. A talented tight end for the Browns, catching, blocking, all pro, a Hall of Famer. Committed from the word go. Came close in the playoffs as a player. Not touching the ultimate dream. Turned to coaching, working in Cleveland from the Belichick tree. Learning this side of the game, lessons become clear. You'll see. Venturing off on his own, hired as general manager of the Ravens, when the Browns left town, in installing what he believed a blueprint to succeed. A tough, hard-nosed team built on defense. Wins a Super Bowl against the Giants, living the dream. A decade or so later, the Ravens are back in the big game, winning another Super Bowl, with a different coach and quarterback. All this time, Ozzie Newsom remained, a gifted front office executive and a player on the field, a beacon for the NFL Shield. The next poem is called 14 and 2 and Fired. That seems like a fine season, only losing twice in the battles that are the NFL. Requirements, plenty of ice. With a relatively young team, what could be ahead? Not with this coach, fired instead. The general manager and the coach not on the same page. How can the team blossom on the big stage? They get a bye and play at home, awaiting Tom Brady, who isn't alone. The Patriots are a team, week to week a different player, shows up to secure the seam. The Chargers are fired up in the California sun, and Brady throws an interception, Could it be the game is won? No. Patriots receiver Troy Brown circles back and strips the ball. He's played defense before. The play instant Patriots lore. So Marty Schottenheimer is fired after going 14-2. Troy Brown just made a play. Clutch all time on this day. The next poem is called The Steel Curtain. This one not taking shape in Moscow, but in Pittsburgh, the Steel City. Hard work here is truly a vow. Back to back in 74 and 75, and again in 78 and 1979. Four Super Bowls in six years. To achieve this, partner with fate, every unit had to play great. The defensive line, Mean Joe Green, L.C. Greenwood, Ernie Holmes, and Dwight White, the best ever, winning most every fight. The linebackers, another all-time core, and the secondary with Mel Blunt, so tough to score. The offense did an incredible job during this run. Along with this defense, winning is so much fun. Two times they beat Tom Landry with his own trademark defense, the Flex. Close title games, the Tex. No defense has ever come close in comparison to rate. The Steel Curtain was just that great. The next poem is called Bo Jackson. Playing football and baseball equal in measure, two sports leagues wanted him. A diamond, pearl, a treasure. Speed and power in place in both sports. Track star speed, power at the plate. Bursting through the line, hardly ever late. Making an all-time throw from the warning track, a speedster out at home. And running with the Raiders, electric, on grass or in a dome. Becoming a commercial star, Bo Jackson was in demand. Hollywood and Madison Avenue, imagining his trajectory, just how far. He injured his hip being tackled. Football was done, but baseball still possible. Replace the hip, make a run. His first game back at bat, he hit it out of the park, dedicated to his mother. I told you, Mom, I'd get it done. For fans, Bo Jackson's sports career, so much fun. The next poem is called The 1985 Bears. Going 
15 and 1 in the regular season, almost perfect, except for a trip to Miami on Monday night to play Dan Marino in the Dolphins, a pinpoint air attack, the reason. The 46 defense of the Bears, legendary, a Buddy Ryan design, and for one particular year, the best ever seen, quite rare. They made a music video during the season, the Super Bowl shuffle, and backed it up. This team, gritty, tough. They blew through the NFC playoffs, beating the Giants 21 to nothing and the Rams 24 to nothing. On the AFC side, the Patriots win on the road against the Jets and the Raiders, then visit Dan Marino and the Dolphins for the right to face the Bears in the Super Bowl. The Patriots win in Miami. No rematch coming, Dolphins and Bears. The Bears crushed the Patriots 46 to 10. Many fans believe the dream matchup would be round two of that Monday night game. History would never be the same. <clears throat> the next poem is called Earl Campbell. He won the Heisman Trophy in 1977 as a senior for the University of Texas. In 1978, he was drafted number one overall by the Houston Oilers. The Lone Star State had another big star. And in his first three seasons, he burst onto the scene going far. He was Rookie of the Year in 1978 and rushing champion. 1,450 yards. In his first Monday night game, he scored four times and rushed for 199 yards. A coming out party, early NFL fame. In 1979, he was league MVP, rushing for 1,697 yards. 1980 brought his third straight rushing title, an incredible 1,934 yards gained on the ground. His speed and power, the combination, rarely found. His Oilers would meet the Steelers in two straight AFC title games. The Steelers prevail, going on to win. Back-to-back -back Super Bowls again. Earl Campbell was a joy to behold. The Oilers had some, someone unique, a maestro, within their fold. A running back for the ages, lighting up the stage. Speed, power, grit, and some rage. The next poem is called In Threes. The Trinity in hockey, Gordie Howe, Bobby Orr, Wayne Gretzky, Lake Eagles all would soar. In Dallas, several Trinities would form, inside and out the norm. Troy Aikman, Michael Irvin, and Emmett Smith called the triplets. Three-time Super Bowl champs, all three in the hall. Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson, and Barry Switzer Heard it in a dynasty, three Super Bowl wins in four years. They didn't fall, but another three comes to mind in Dallas lore. The builder of the flex defense, Tom Landry, giving up only three in his first Super Bowl win, 24-3 against the Dolphins, a defensive masterpiece. Landry worked alongside Lombardi as assistants for the Giants in 1956, winning the NFL title 47-7. Now 24 to 3 to capture a Super Bowl, defensive heaven. <clears throat> the next poem is called Going Out on Top. In basketball, Bill Russell finished his career back to back in 1968 and 1969, as player coach no less. <clears throat> Eleven titles retire its time. Jerome Bettis retired, winning the title in his hometown. The tank is almost empty for the bus. Exhale, rejoice. We did it, us. Ray Lewis announced he would retire, and the Ravens went on a playoff run, winning the Super Bowl. Going out this way, so much fun. John Elway retired, winning back-to-back -back Super Bowls, walking away on top. Bronco fans remember him being 0-3 in his first three Super Bowls. He kept fighting, along with the owner, his coaches, and team. We still believe in you. Finish the dream. 
With a Hall of Fame runner to be, Terrell Davis fit beautifully with Elway. Now they had a high octane attack. They said John Elway was a loser. Perhaps wait until the story is complete. Riding off a winner with a back to back. This Bronco had a Super Bowl repeat. The next poem is called The Young Tiger and the Old Bear. Super Bowl 53 matched two coaches against one another. Sean McVay at 33, the young offensive genius who other teams are hiring coaches that match his age and style. And Bill Belichick, age 66, the defensive sage who coached Lawrence Taylor while on Parcells' staff. Seeing up close the greatest defensive player ever to suit up, Fury Unleash. And now coaches Tom Brady, the GOAT, on that side of the ball, precision released. The score, 3-3, three to three, entering the fourth quarter, an epic defensive battle. Pats and Rams fans on the edge of their seat. Wade Phillips at 70, the defensive coordinator for the Rams, pitching his own masterpiece. One play, one drive could seal it. In sight, the prize. The pressure is intense. Who will rise? Experience on the Patriots' side. Hunger burns within. Sean McVay and the Rams let it ride. A knockout blow will unfold and will define the story when it's told. Who will step up and grab the gold? The fourth moves on, still tied 3-3. Three to three. Josh McDaniels, the Patriots offensive coordinator, calls his mates aside. Let's scrap our plan, regroup, and see. They send in two tight ends, a fullback, running back, and receiver. A power football set. A pass to Gronk for 18. He'll go get. Then three plays, they line up the same and target three players for completions. The last, a 29-yard beautiful floater to Gronk, who cradles it in at the two, between three defenders. Here, coach, first down. Do what you do. Sony, the rookie, runs it in for the TD. The old bear uses all his tools. To tire the young Tiger and his crew, one more drive running the ball. Gets them three and ices the game 13-3. to three. Belichick and Brady get to six rings. Michael Jordan championship territory. Belichick's finest hour, a defensive jewel. Brady leads late scoring drives. Still plenty left of fuel. In his young years, Belichick coached Lawrence Taylor, the best ever on D. Now the old bear, with plenty of fight still, outdoes the young, young new face of the league. Holds them to three, iron will. <clears throat> the next poem is called Watched But Didn't. Working, working, different shifts, days and times, no set schedule or days off. Punch in at 6 a.m. one day, 4 p.m. the next. Too much sleep or not enough. The modern world, comforts and exhaust. Working weekends is the norm. Watching football takes a back seat. But one thing emerged, a joy for the fan and me. The highlight films created from the game broadcast. Edited from play by play. Seemingly light hears from the days when highlights of games were a part comedy skit and game breakdown. The new way is perfect. No performance required. All season, I only saw a few games, but enjoyed football as never before. Did you watch the game? No, but I did the highlights. Not knowing the results, the condensed drama felt the same. The highlight films reveal not the score, only the team involved, and a little more. Two conference title games that day, January of 2019, on on Sunday, and I worked. The conference title games already played. I didn't know the outcome. Don't turn on the radio on the way home. Opened up my laptop when settling in, hoping not to see a score or photo of what transpired today. Get lucky. See the highlight thumbnail. Rams versus Saint. NFC title game. Click on and watch. Not knowing what happened. Love it. Let's begin. Watch a 15-minute film, enjoying all the excitement, the thrills. 
caught up in who will win. Next video in line, AFC title game, Patriots versus Chiefs. It goes into overtime. Both games that day, Tom Brady leads them down the field, a final pass to Gronk down the seam to the 15-yard line. First down. Three runs up the middle, they score onto the Super Bowl. I get to watch the next game in full, still work, but get off early enough. Brady and Belichick get to six rings. Maybe my most fun season yet as a fan, watching but not watching, not knowing the results, enjoying every minute. <clears throat> the next poem is called Like John and Paul. The British Invasion, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, so many more. Wonderful in tone, so pleasing to the ear. Artists and technicians, the pen, the piano, and the guitar. NFL films in the early days, the sound is turned down. Only images light the control room. But turning the audio dial, the music grips the space. Another style is created, formed. NFL Films finds musicians in a conductor, Sam Spence, that match the sport, like Mozart and Brahms, perfect harmony. The Beatles appear on American TV, and the country is a maze. Eric Clapton creates the first super band, and FM radio rises, not a phase. The music from NFL Films doesn't make it to number one on the charts. But the sound rings true. To fans listening, the magic is there, like John and Paul. The next poem is called Mental Toughness. Not a prodigy in high school, nowhere near, but instilled inside, deep in the core, a fire burns. No wind or rain can touch it. Encased and protected, take a deep breath, turn up the flames. A greater fuel than natural talent, a power source to draw upon. The mind is strength, no bicep can match. Work and effort keep the tank full. The flame never thirsts, burning, burning, steady, always there like the sun. Not the strongest or fastest, not to worry. Mentally strong will overtake. Mountains will crumble, giants will fall. In the late rounds, all the work shows up. The naturally Naturally gifted, some winded and tired, the knockout blow unleashed and fired. <clears throat> the next poem is called Used to Be. Back in the day, Kirk Gowdy made the call January 1969 behind the mic for Super Bowl III, the historic upset of the NFL by the upstart league, the AFL. Broadway Joe Namath leading the way. Football in the counterculture, counterculture mixing for all to see on a cloudy day. Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire for CBS. Solid job all around. Dick Emberg and Merlin Olson on NBC. Better partnerships rarely found. The big rivals then, the late games, Cowboys Redskins, Chiefs Raiders. Howard Koschel ushered in a new age the broadcaster as Hollywood star, telling it like it is. ABC's Monday Night Football grew, blossomed, went far. No field turf then, muddy games, fields as ponds. Pouring rain coming down, all can be lived again or seen for the first time. The digital age provides the gate. Watching Broadway Joe on the stage, White shoes zipping the ball, the past comes alive, rising tall. <clears throat> the next poem is called The New King. Baseball ruled the airwaves, radio, and then early TV. Newspapers printed stories of the babe, Joe D. Jackie, which flowed like lyrics, seeing the World Series in storefront windows or listening from radios at home. In the car, sometimes from open doors, in the age of locking less and trusting more. From the roaring 20s on, baseball is king. Stars always emerging, a comet's dust. But then in 1958, football grips the nation. The NFL title game goes into overtime. 
electric black and white TV images, VNC, a new era dawning. A different energy to this game, at the very least. Football, some say, is perfect for TV, and people are drawn in. Lombardi built a dynasty in the 1960s, or excellence for all to see. Five titles in nine years, and fans think this football thing agrees with me. Baseball captured an era in lyric and song, but football has a marching band. One, two, three games all day long. The next poem is called The Slot. <clears throat> Bullet Bob Hayes for the Cowboys, Olympic gold medalist in the 100. Lines up wide. Cliff Branch of the Raiders, a sprint champ in school. Runs a time like Carl Lewis would later win to win gold. 10.0 seconds. Has blistering speed. Run the go route at the corner's cost. Randy Moore, so fast, great hands down the sidelines. Defenders lost. The inside is for tight ends, but not always, but for the most part, but the game would change. Less fullbacks, add another receiver. Their game is over the middle, open range. Perhaps the team that uses the slot the most to deadly effect is the Patriots. Troy Brown, then Wes Welker, playoff Danny and Julian Edelman. The torch burns on, over the middle, a lot of traffic, better be tough, no stoplights in sight. The game evolves, keep up, fight. The slot receiver may be a college quarterback learning a different skill. In the middle, they crash, bump, claw. No easy hill. <clears throat> the next poem is called Keep It Pure. The point spread has its allure. Jets minus 17 point dogs to the Colts. They win and defeat the mighty NFL. The Patriots, minus 14-point dogs to the Rams, the greatest show on turf. Doesn't get it done this time. Jimmy the Greek made his mark, talking, not talking, about the spread. I like them by a field goal. The NFL makes a deal with Las Vegas. Are they looking over profits ledge? The sports books continue to grow. The house has a decided edge. <clears throat> My interest is in who wins the game, not interested in the points. Oh, don't get me wrong. I've had my gambling years, winning and giving it back and losing. A jackpot, big shot, paint the town, but never betting on sports. Winning the game, division, advancing, that's the juice for me. So in sports, I kept it pure. Never betting a 10-teamer or one. I've been gripped with gambling fever, so I paid my dues in the life, just not on sports, save from some strife. <clears throat> the next poem is called The Goat of Goats. Tom Brady gets to six rings, no debate now it seems. In the NFL, he's the goat. He's in Michael Jordan territory, getting this far. In the NFL, Brady strives, fights, and reaches the bar. In the NBA, Michael Jordan is widely considered the GOAT. 6-0 in the finals. Never won going to seven games. Some say Bill Russell should get the nod. 11 rings in 13 seasons. In the NBA, make your case. Either one provides many logical reasons. Hockey has its GOAT, the great one, Wayne Gretzky, four Stanley Cups in five years, a dynasty. The prolific scorer and passer, circling in the zone, buying time, a pass, a score on the dime. But the greatest of all time, Babe Ruth. Like Gretzky, the Babe broke all the offensive records, but unlike, Babe Ruth started on defense as a pitcher, winning 92 games, three World Series title, then switches and becomes the all-time hitter, the goat of goats, greatest of all time, Babe Ruth. An inter interesting discussion 
Please consider. <clears throat> the next poem is called The Great Atoll. Playing on teams 16 games, hardly ever seeing the playoffs, compared to those extra games, a consistent winner, playoff runs, which batters the body more? All those playoff games or losing and being pushed around and going home early? Do the losers take it easy, spare my body, get paid, don't plug the hole and stop the run? In weeks we go home and have fun. Maybe in the analytics age, an answer comes forth. I don't have the numbers in my mind. I'm seeing the stage. Maybe it's a little of both. Lose and get beat down or ease off the gas. Go home early, paint the town. Make the playoffs consistently. Extra seasons may add up. Plus, the win or go home intensity, like hockey, a nasty run to the cup. Some take less to win a ring. Others want to get paid only the bling. Winning it all, the grind, now they sing. <clears throat> the next poem is called Touchdown Chess. Came up with a board game. Thought it was pretty cool. Combining the classic games of football and chess. And hopefully, simple enough rules. Took a shot with commercial time. Didn't hit it big. Are more geared to the production side, selling its own gig. Sold it in large pizza type boxes, the board folded in the middle, the next phase made of cloth, and a package so little. Play on football Sunday and move here and there during ads, the coffee table, the focus. A good game is brewing, and not only on the TV viewing. The next poem is called Gronk's Finest Hour. Rob Gronkowski was a throwback, a blocking tight end when needed, and a sure-handed pass catcher, his overall game complete, no slack. He talked often of what they do, grind. It's the Patriots' way, a state of mind, with hands as soft as a power forward going in for a dunk or blocking a defensive lineman who's suddenly in a funk. Gronk is the best ever at his position. Footwork as good as Sugar Ray and power like Hitman Hearns. They'll pay. His performance in his last play playoff run, one for the ages, a setting sun. Against the Chiefs, big catches late in the fourth quarter and overtime, securing the Patriots' fate. In the Super Bowl against the Ram, two catches in the only TD drive. One sure-handed grab at the two. Here you go, coach. Th see it through. He walks away a winner, a champ. New challenges ahead. Horizons to explore. Riding into the sunset. Take that exit ramp. His tail wrapped, secured in football lore. He worked, grinded, many times a chore. Gronk's finest hour, tower of power. <clears throat> The next poem is called 50 Years. January 1969, the Jets win Super Bowl III. Many believe the most historic Super Bowl ever, the reason. The upstart AFL beats the NFL for the first time. Truly a dream season. Vince Lombardi and the Packers win convincingly in Super Bowl I and II. The new league no match. The AFL Jets are 17-point underdogs to the NFL's 15-1 Colts in Super Bowl III, but they win 16-7. The Jets haven't returned to the Super Bowl in the 50 years since. The AFL Chiefs win Super Bowl IV January 1970. The next year, the leagues merge. The NFL is 50 years old in 1970. They started in 1920 in Canton, Ohio. The Roaring Twenties are back, 2020. The Chiefs win the Super Bowl in 1970 and 50 years later in 2020. Maybe all those years out in the cold for the Jets and Chiefs was their penance. The leagues merged after Super Bowl IV, both leagues with two wins. In 2020, the NFL is 100. After 50 years, 
a new era begins. <clears throat> the next poem is called An Unwritten Holiday. Opening Sunday of the football season has a feeling all its own, a celebration every autumn at stadiums, bars, and at home. Fans love to start 1-0. It gives Sunday evening a glow. Monday morning, no problem. Bring it on. I'm in the flow. Drive to work and listen to sports ra radio and relive the win. Still excited. Can't wait for the work day to begin. And here comes Chris, another diehard fan of my team, with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Did you see that comeback? Let the season begin. Oh, if they could bottle it, sell it in stores, opening day excitement, followed by a victory, a natural happy pill. We through this story, driving home the radio blasts, with fans loving their team's cast. The first Sunday, some fans pray and think, it does feel like a holiday. <clears throat> Next poem is called Knockout, 1980 style. The 1980s stand alone, a decade frozen in time. Don Johnson rocks in Miami Vice and Dan Marino cool as ice. Marvelous Marvin Hagler destroys Tommy Hearns, retains his belt, and the Patriots lose to the Bears 46-10 in the Super Bowl. For Chicago, on this day, no cares. Sugar Ray Leonard defeats Roberto Duran this time. The second fight, hands of stones, unwinds. John Riggins breaks a tackle to seal a Super Bowl title. Legit, no crime. Ray Boom Boom Mancini draws inspiration from his father. And Joe Montana, so cool and doesn't tire, drives them 92 yards, fire and desire. Tom Selleck chilling in the tropical sun while Bill Parcells leads the Giants to a Super Bowl win. So much fun. Michael Spinks dominates the light heavies, the Spinks jinx, either hand lethal, and the Raiders crush to win it all, 38-9. Just win, baby, standing tall. In 1984, George Orwell, Orwell's book is reprinted, A Warning to the Future, Freedom Has a Cost. The 1980s culture, unique, its own brand, carved in stone, saved, never lost. <clears throat> the next poem is called A Welcoming Town. Las Vegas, Nevada, the meadows, moisture in the desert, ensures life, destiway, destination water, the aim. Mark Twain trekked to the Silver State, looking for riches, stakes his claim. The Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad connecting two cities, Las Vegas in the middle, sitting pretty. People are drawn here, water, silver, rail. Work hard here, chances you won't fail. The wild, wild west, a frontier, a trail to blaze. And gambling takes root, silver on the table, plenty of loot. Howard Hughes arrives, turns a mob town into a, into a corporate hub. Wall Street follows, and Tony and Paulie see their future back underground. Circus Circus creates blue-collar gaming. High Roll is no longer the only mark. Steve Wynn builds the Mirage, the first super casino, a desert shark. The NFL's Raiders are moving here. The city grows, expands, more in play. John Gruden leads them in, the silver and black, a new day. A 3-2 Super Bowl record in their belt, a solid stake, roll the dice. A welcoming town, always nice. <clears throat> the next poem is called Assembled. A 3-4 defense, a Belichick core, once featured Lawrence Taylor during their Giants days, sports lore. Now for Patriots fans, I list a team, all time a unit, a dream. The line shapes up with Willie McGinnis, Richard Seymour, Vince Wilfork in the middle. Champions all, no riddle. Blue chippers hold this line. Willie, number four in the draft from USC. Richard, number six from Georgia. Vince, number 21 from Miami. Think they'll do just fine. The linebackers, four in the group, all committed, close the loop. 
Teddy Bruschi and Mike Vrabel played together, holding strong. And Andre Tippett, a black belt, Hall of Famer, all day long. Dante Hightower rises in prime time. Super Bowl excellence, his calling card. The secondary, Ty Law, pick six in the Super Bowl, his time to shine. Malcolm Butler, ice water for blood. Mike Haynes, Hall of Famer champion. Devin McCourty, no one gets deep. Assemble this unit, rewards they reap. The next poem is called Sleepwalkers and Sports Radio. Working retail in Las Vegas shifts all over the place. 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. one day, 4 p.m. start the next. Either too little sleep or too much. Driving to and from work, sports radio is on my dial. The local and national shows, Cofield and Company, ESPN Vegas, becomes the Buffalo Bills power hour for a season, an afternoon trip. And Scott Farrell, the Steeler fan, brings his show to Las Vegas. I listen late night when I can. We get our schedule on Saturday. The next work week starts on Sunday. What days am I working? And I'm full-time. The part-time is locked in a deeper control. How about an 8, 8 p.m. to midnight and back in the morning? Sleepwalkers in the retail world. For workers, a warning. A nice early shift, banker's hours. I listen to The Herd, a Vegas supporter and Seahawks fan who is not high on Jay Cutler, and don't mention Malcolm Butler. This month, I had four out of five days off and worked eight in a row, all over the place, keeping you off balance, the retail rat race. 51 to 3 is the title of the next poem. Moving on to their first Super Bowl after a win with such a huge margin, the Bills crushed the Raiders 51-3. to For Al Davis, this day no bargain. It seems no one will stop this stampede, a crown all but assured. The Super Bowl a formality. The Bills have all they need. The cake on offense led by Jim Kelly, intense and prolific, fire in the belly. How can they be stopped after this? Good luck the next opponent, they wish. Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick await. This Super Bowl powerhouse team stopping them in baseball terms, no field of dreams. But hold on, they have a plan. Slow down the game. Ride old pro O.J. Anderson. Run the ball, old school. Yes, we can. It's working. Jim Kelly awaits his turn. No shootout this day. Inside he burns. The final score, 20-19, to 19, Giants win. Scott Norwood sails a kick wide right, but it was the game plan that won the battle. Let's turn this game into a fight. <clears throat> the next poem is called My Friend Jeff. He loved football, he surely did. Talking not only the home team, but around the league. I watched that team, he would say, with a laser's intensity and an interest pure and engaged. Most of my friends these days talk the home team. That's cool, but I miss Jeff, who passed away far too early. Many more years for him should have been a universal rule. But he was called, needed in another home. The Lord and angels now have him. And I imagine they listen also with interest as he unpacks the games seeing things others miss above the rim. Nowadays, I ask other fans of my team, want to break off and talk maybe Jerry Jones and the Cowboys? No, they say, let's keep it in the backyard. Jeff would have wandered with me. Sure, he would say, let's talk Jerry or the Vikings, the Raiders, the Bills, all the games, the players, the plans. He embraced and found thrills. He is missed by me and so many more. But the life that burned so strongly at his core. The next poem is called 2100. Will the game still exist? Unless change, probably not, considering the risk. Maybe it will be reshaped, a reform. No, Tom Brady won't still be playing in the year 2100, stretched far from here. He gave it an incredible run, not the norm. But let's move our attention decades out or so, seeing the future from the furthest row. 
fitting its time like faith reborn. Maybe people will just look back through the lens, the game's concept attack. So much will change by then. Hopefully the average person, the hard worker, will be put at the front of the line about time. Sports will have to adapt. Will football reshape its landscape? Hard to say. Who knows? Bodies smashing into one another a century out? It doesn't seem a logical bet. Only time will tell. Perhaps a more streamlined game already taking shape. A pictured frame. Football has a structure. 100 yards of chess. Move the chains down the field. The sport so far at least a bountiful yield. The next poem is called Two and a Half Hour Games. Already the trend taking place. All these commercials coming at me. Sorry, my mind no longer willing to give them the space. Three plus hour games, too long. At the stadium, players standing around. Another TV timeout. Pick up the pace between rounds. Keep halftime about the same. Just make the actual game the show. Not all these ads. Needed more flow. It's not as overhauling as it sounds. Actually, more money will be found. The league will now be able to fit four television games in a row on Sunday. Oh, now they're interested, and the fans will be relieved of these commercial conventions wrapped around a game. Any in favor of these cuts? The days of hour-long programming and enduring 20 minutes of ads seems out of date, a worn-out fad. Two and a half hour game seems worth a try. Ad after ad, too much. Streamline your product. Be in touch. Remember, it's the customers in line. They buy and you're fine. The next poem, Jerry Jones. My team is in the AFC and I'm a diehard fan, but I keep an eye on the Cowboys, America's team, as much as I can. The star on the helmet draws me in, and their owner, Jerry Jones, I root for. Go, Cowboys, just win. A maverick in business and branding, he convinced the league to move to Las Vegas. Lots of money, international city, a smooth landing. He presided over a dynasty in Dallas, three championships in four years, needing two coaches to get it done. Jerry Jones did his job, and they won. Since then, a rocky road, no Super Bowl wins, but always fighting. High energy and focus, Texas Lightning. He's a showman in a TV league. In business, good luck keeping up. He built a stadium that's all the rage, like a Texas Longhorn busting out of the cage. Jerry Jones keeps things interesting. Win or lose, he's in the news. Fighting, striving, what's next? He will work and work, page after page, moving forward, his text. The next poem is called Joe Montana. 4-0 Super Bowl record, no interceptions, outduels Marino and Elway, future Hall of Famers, and beats the Bengals twice. They passed on coach Bill Walsh, defeating them so nice. On the way in the NFC, running into coaches, Parcells, Gibbs, Ditka, Landry, all-timers with squads to match. And against Landry and the Cowboys, there was Dwight Clark and the catch. His reputation started in college. The Cotton Bowl with rain and ice, Joe Cool with a fever high, completed an epic comeback under a cold and bitter Texas sky. In a tough NFC title game loss, he took a shot in the back. It hurt so much he didn't realize in his hand was a crack. Joe Montana, some consider the best. Among 49er fans, forget all the rest. Some may side with Tom Brady, seven rings. Either way, both did amazing things. Under the fog sits the Bay Bridge. Joe stands alone, thinking on the high ridge. The next poem is called The Original Eight. Formed in 1960, the AFL, American Football League, wants a seat at the table. The mighty NFL looks down upon them. You're shaky at best, not stable. Little by little, they build with stars. Name it, Lance, Dawson, Bell. Watch out, we're coming. Fans can tell. The Patriots, Jets, Bills, Oilers, Raiders, Chiefs, Chargers, Broncos fill out the league. 
the NFL caught a little off guard, not expecting a battle or siege. Their first two Super Bowls they meet. The NFL with Lombardi in the pack, you're no match. Back to the cheap rack. But in Super Bowl three emerges a shift. The AFL with Namath and the Jets win. We're still here. Suddenly a rift. Super Bowl four evens the field. The AFL Chiefs win a golden yield. Next year the leagues merge. Even Steven, we're two and two with the NFL. What a finish. Epic AFL lore. The upstart league held their own. Now move into the fold. We're at the table, just not as old. The next poem is called, If Brady's the King, Bledsoe's the Prince. Some say with seven rings, that's surely enough. Jordan Territory, another one who was tough. Tom Brady made his way into Gretzky status both with point guard skills seeing things others miss amongst the apparatus. Drew Bledsoe was big time, the number one overall pick. Brady the opposite at 199, fight, work hard, confident in his chances to stick. Both under the banner of the same crown. When Brady arrived, they were 0-3 in championship games, losing an AFL title, big cost, and two Super Bowls, Drew Bledsoe the quarterback, of the latest Super Bowl loss. Tom, in season two, fills in for Drew, and Drew steps in for injured Tom in the AFC title game, Pat's win. Who will start the Super Bowl? A mystery. Against the greatest show on turf, Brady gets the nod, and the rest is history. Bledsoe traded to the Bills. He leaves with class and grace. Patriots fans appreciate this. They understand one has to win the race. Tom then takes them to never seen heights. In New England, if Brady's the king, Bledsoe's the prince. And the last poem is called Thanksgiving. Once a year we gather to celebrate our nation and spend time with family and friends, turkey, stuffing and pie, and open invitation. You're new to the city, and far from home. Come on over, no need to be alone. We give thanks to our country, look what hard work has done. So take the day off, relax and enjoy, and watch some football with the fading autumn sun. And after turkey, we'll sit and watch the game, debating which one of our teams is better. Every year, the same. How could the pilgrims have known what this day would become? Family, food, and football, on this day, our nation is one. <clears throat> well, I hope you enjoyed the book, Football Poems, a collection of 70. I'm the writer, Joe Mahan, and I and, uh, appreciate you listening, and God bless. <laughs>